In this guide, you're going to learn the 10 biggest macro mistakes players make that hold them back from ranking up. My name's Hex. I'm a multi-season challenger player that's been teaching League of Legends here at Skillcapped for over 10 years. And if there's one thing I've learned in that time, it's that being good at League doesn't require you to have crazy good mechanics. You can see big rank gains just by fixing a few simple macro mistakes that you likely don't even know you're making. So my promise to you is if you focus on fixing just one or two of the mistakes listed in this guide, that you're going to see significant results. Results. And speaking of ranking up, we have a new special limited time offer just for you guys. This video was actually inspired by our brand new macro course on our website, where we walk you through in just 15 easy to understand steps everything you need to know about macro in League of Legends. This course has been getting perfect 5 star ratings by players just like you, and is a part of our massive update adding all brand new courses for season 14. To celebrate this, we're offering an exclusive limited time discount through the link below. So what do you wait Waiting for. Click the link in the description to get the rank you've always wanted this season. Alright, so jumping into the video, the first macro mistake players are making in Season 14 is not understanding the concept of cross mapping, especially when it comes to the new Void Grubs. Don't worry, cross mapping is actually really easy to understand. Here we have Xin Zhao exiting base and spots Graves topside, moving to take Void Grubs. Here's the problem, he fell behind early and so is weaker than Graves and can't fight over these Grubs. However, in the new season, Void Grubs actually spawn at the same time as dragon. So instead of just giving the void grubs up for free, you can implement a cross map play to take dragon. The reason why cross mapping works is because when you spot the enemy on one side of the map, it guarantees a number advantage on the other. This is how he's able to take dragon at the same time the enemy takes void grubs, despite being behind. Let me show you what it looks like if you don't cross map and get punished for the mistake. Here, Graves moves through mid with the intention of going for the void grubs. You can see from the enemy Vi's perspective how she can see Graves heading straight for these grubs. Vi even has Twisted Fate ganking bot side right now, so she should immediately move from her raptors to cross map and take dragon. Instead, she makes the mistake of not cross mapping and farms as normal. So the dragon is now still alive, and after Graves takes raptors and picks up a kill mid, suddenly he has the number advantage and can take dragon, getting both early objectives. And there's a very specific reason why this is so bad now in season 14, when you miss this cross map play on the void grubs. Here, Graves gets a kill on mid, which means he has a number advantage for any fight at the grubs. However, instead of Warwick recognizing he needs to cross map, he goes to contest the Void Grubs 2v3 and of course loses the fight. And now, as you just learned, the enemy jungler has a chance to both take the Void Grubs, but then also potentially take Dragon after. When this happens, the game can really snowball out of control, since not only does that jungler obviously get both the first Void Grubs and Dragon, but unlike the first spawn of Grubs and Dragon, the second spawns are actually desynced. This means it's much easier to then secure the next Void Grub spawn, for 6 stacks total, into the second Dragon once it spawns after. Basically, in that second spawn, there is no longer a cross map opportunity to help equalize if you're behind. That's why it's so important in Season 14 to recognize when you have the cross map opportunity on the first Void Grub and Dragon spawn. Now, mistake number two. Players either don't understand lane priority, or they do understand it, but don't realize there's actually important nuances to how to use it in a solo queue game. So very quickly, what is lane priority? All it means is which laner can react to something first. 99% of the time, the player who has the push advantage has lane priority. This is for two reasons. First, by pushing. Positionally, they'll just be closer to most fights on the map. Second, by pushing they have an advantage, since they cleared their wave first, meaning the opponent would have to give up the golden XP from their wave to react. So, as a general rule, junglers want to play around their lanes that have lane priority, while laners will want to push and secure that lane priority when their junglers are nearby. Most macro choices in the laning phase are actually created through lane priority. For example, let's say you wanted to take an objective, like Dragon. Well, in this case, we can see we have lane priority bot once Lucian pushes the wave. And you can see how this forces Ezreal to move to the wave to pick up the CS, causing him to be pinned to his tower momentarily. And if we check mid, we can see Xerath has pushed to secure lane priority and can pivot to take Dragon as well. Since two lanes have lane priority, that means we're safe to go for this objective. Now, there is one thing everyone gets wrong when they learn lane priority for the first time. They don't understand how there's a bit of nuance to the positioning and timing. For example, here we have lane priority in mid lane. However, if we look top, despite Akali having the clear minion lead, it's not yet pushed. Meaning, technically, the enemy gangplank isn't pinned down yet and can react to this invade. At the same time, notice how Cassiopeia, despite on the surface lacking lane priority can still react before Zara due to how close the enemy raptors are to mid. Now, if Xin Zhao was going for void grubs instead, this wouldn't be an issue, as Zerath would cut off the angles and be able to react first. This is why you have to factor in positioning, not just a pushed wave. So Xin Zhao smartly plays safe here and backs off, and this buys time for Zerath to finish fully crashing the wave mid. This is the timing element of this. When a wave
wave crashes is when lane priority is often at its most powerful. Notice how Cassiopeia is much more pinned and how Xerath is in a much better position to react. This also coincides with the big wave top crashing. Now it's safe for Zen Zhao to play much more aggressive. This is why it's important. Don't just assume laners have priority because they're pushed. You actually have to move your camera to the lane and see the actual position them and the minions are in. There's also a common mistake laners make when they go for lane priority. You see, priority is best used when your jungler is nearby. For example, here a bot lane is pushing. They have lane priority and the nearby dragon is alive and can be taken. However, notice how their mid is out of mana and loses lane priority. At the same time, their jungler recalled and so is just heading back onto the map, nowhere near them. This is when lane priority ends up being harmful to have, as it just means you're overextended and vulnerable to ganks. Since like in this case, the mid laner or jungler wouldn't be able to counter gank. Not understanding lane priority is the most common mistake players make in the early game. You can see here, the blue team doesn't have priority mid or lane priority top either. And yet, the jungler Ivern is looking to play aggressive on the map. And so what do you know? Yone gets to the fight before Rise and Darius gets there before the enemy top. This is why, whether it's taking objectives or fighting, those macro decisions should be made based on lane priority. Okay, I already know what you're thinking. That involves relying on teammates. That's just not a thing in solo queue. And you are right, kind of. You see, when you're in a position like the blue team here, where the enemy bot lane has lane priority and the enemy mid has lane priority as well and the health advantage, and you see Dragon is up and right for the taking, well, that's when you use cross mapping, just like we taught you in the last section. Do as this graves, whether it's stealing enemy camps, taking the opposite side objectives, such as the void grubs if they were alive here, or just looking for a gank on the opposite side lane. Remember, the enemy is going to be preoccupied on the other side of the map, so you always have that number advantage on the side you're on. And this is a perfect transition to mistake number three. Players constantly get caught by the changes to early death timers. Not too long ago, near the end of last season, Riot actually added a massive change to respawn timers. They made you respawn much faster from levels 1 to 9, and level 4 is when it gets most significant, as it went from 12 seconds to 8 seconds. Keep in mind, whenever you respawn, you'll get a 66% movement speed bonus for 5 seconds. However, this home guard bonus does not apply to recalls until 14 minutes into the game. So, a lot of players haven't adjusted to how fast these early game respawn timers are. For example, here you can see the red team's bot lane double kills the enemy bot. Great, in passing, Seasons, this was a green light to take something off the map using the enemy's death timers against them. However, in this season, the timing is so short that when this Elise decides to take the scuttle before Dragon instead of rushing Dragon, well, she just cemented her team's doom. Now, her bot lane is low on health and mana from the fight. Meanwhile, the enemy bot lane is already getting back way faster than expected with full HP and mana and an item advantage from being able to buy items. You can see how the four second faster respawn makes all the difference. As now the enemy bot gets there just in time to fight over the Dragon and prevent Elise's team from escaping. So, until it's 9 minutes in the game, if you're making a play off the enemy death timers, you need to capitalize on it way faster than last season. Alright, mistake number 4 players are making in Season 14 all has to do with the new Rift Herald. You see, in past seasons, Rift Herald was amazing. You'd get it before 14 minutes, and so you could use it on turret plates, often generating a thousand gold or more from it. Now, the Rift Herald will spawn much later at 14 minutes. This is exactly when plates fall, so it's simply not as valuable as before. But that's not the main mistake. The mistake is, players don't realize Riot added a new passive to the Rift Herald in Season 14, where the last enemy it attacks will do 50% less damage. For example, my first auto attack does 52 damage here, and yet, after the Herald autos me, my second auto attack does 26, half as much. This slows down Rift Herald a lot. Side note, one thing I see players mechanically doing wrong is they'll group up for it, but then the guy who has the most DPS is the one tanking. This means they get the 50% damage debuff, when in reality it should be the support or whoever does the least amount of damage tanking it instead. Macro wise though, this is what players are all doing wrong. They go to solo Rift Herald thinking they can take it in the same amount of time as last season, and yet are so slow the enemy pretty much always collapses on them, completely screwing them over. So there's a couple of tips to avoid this happening. First, you have to realize the current Rift Herald is not nearly as valuable as before. In fact, it's arguably the weakest objective in the game right now. So often what's more valuable than getting the Herald is actually winning the fight around it. This is why it's actually better to treat it as a tool to snowball if you're ahead. The enemy team often doesn't realize how low in value it is, so they often mistakenly contest you taking it when you're ahead. Basically, if the enemy is just turtling at their towers, it can be a nice way to lure them out and force a team fight. And of course, the opposite is also true. If you're behind, don't feel so bad about giving up the Herald to the enemy. It's really not as big of a deal as last season. Now, our next mistake is one I never hear anyone talk about. After the Rift Herald is taken, there's basically an awkward lull in the action as Baron isn't alive yet, and so for a decent amount of time there's no objectives to fight over except for a single dragon spawn at some point. And yet, I see plays like this constantly. Despite no objectives being on the map, Senna goes toward topside, again, Baron is not spawning for another 3 minutes, and Senna gets caught out for literally no reason. If we go back to the start, the enemy team is ahead 4k gold. They want fights like these outside of the towers, but if there's no objective they're 
they're threatening, nothing is stopping you from just turtling at the safety of your towers. And it's not just the team that's behind, teams that are ahead make the same mistake. They push up a lane thinking they're applying pressure, but again, if there isn't any objective on the map for their team to take when the enemy sends multiple people to them, they just die for free. I mean, obviously, dying like this is never ideal, but at least when there's an objective to take like Dragon, your team gets something for your death. So, what should you be doing instead? Well, this is where our next mistake comes in. Players don't realize just how important and powerful pushing mid lane can be in the mid to late game. By pushing mid, you open up two key rotations. The first is pushing mid into rotating to the objectives when they're alive, like Dragon and Baron. You can see how when you push a wave mid, it pins the enemy, giving you easy rotations into the river. So, use that first push to clear vision and get vision of your own, ideally deep into the enemy's jungle. Then, when the next wave arrives, you push that one again, reasserting your vision control around the objective. You can keep doing this as many times as needed. Once the enemy is out of wards, it puts them in a lose-lose position. If they don't face check into fog of war, they give up the objective for free. This makes it really easy to set up picks. And then, after the pick, you convert that number advantage into the objective you were baiting for. Now, while you wait for those objectives to spawn, you'll still be doing this. However, instead of rotating to objectives, you're looking to attack the enemy's jungle. The goal here is to steal the enemy's camps and slowly starve them out of resources. Sources. Keep in mind, by stealing camps from the enemy, it's effectively worth two camps, since you're gaining one camp while the enemy loses one. The nice thing about this is it lets you establish deep vision at the same time, again setting up those easy picks. Remember, someone needs to push when that next wave arrives to continue to pin them down mid and maintain that pressure. In this case, with the pick from earlier, they can take the tower with a number advantage. This still doesn't change the strategy though. Keep mid pushed, now with Dragon up, it's an easy rotation to take it uncontested. And this is a perfect transition to mistake number seven. It's important to understand, once the mid game hits, the outer towers are great points of attack. This is actually because of how the map is designed. Notice how the outer towers are very far away from one another, while the inner towers are much closer to each other. And finally, the inhibitor towers are even closer. The effect this has is that it makes towers that are furthest away harder to defend for each team, since there's more ground for the defenders to cover if they want to react to it being attacked. Basically, don't get caught out trying to defend your outer towers if the enemy commits multiple champions. It's actually expected for these to fall in those cases. At the same time, you can implement the pre previous push mid strategy to set up these outer tower attacks. So, if you notice outer towers are still alive, especially bot lane, these are typically great to attack with a mid wave push. You start by pushing mid and pinning the enemy, and then you have this great rotation path. At this point, towers aren't as much of a threat as players outscale towers through items and levels. So, if the enemy makes the mistake of trying to hold it, it makes for an easy tower dive to punish them. You can see how in this case, we're even able to use Rift Herald to just completely snowball the game. Moving on, one important concept that is not taught enough is just how important brushes are in the mid to late game. To prove just how game breaking this can be, I want you to check out the sequence. It starts out with Graves in a brush topside. Notice how both Graves and Rengar are level 10. So Graves is not really ahead of him, and yet the fact that he gets the jump on him makes all the difference in how he's able to dominate the fight. After this, Graves takes Herald, recalls, and heads bot side. It just so happens that as he drops a control ward in the all important river brush, he spots Rengar once again face checking the brush he's in, and once again, again, that's a free kill. Shortly after, waiting in the same brush, this time it's the enemy Twitch support face checking, trying to clear the pink ward and again, super easy kill since he gets the jump on him. Graves invades and hovers on his pushed laners and boy, what do you know, Rengar ulted Vex and he pops out the brush to his surprise again. In the span of around one minute, Graves just got four kills, three on the enemy jungler solely from being in brushes the enemy didn't have vision of. This is why it's incredibly important to have an oracle lens trinket on your team specifically on the support, jungle, and assassin mid laners. Not a lot of players know that at the end of Season 13, Riot hard nerfed the Oracle Lens. They actually reduced the radius at early levels by 150, the duration was nearly cut in half from 10 seconds to 6, and the cooldown was massively increased. This has indirectly made control wards that much more important for you to purchase. So here's the general rule that we recommend you follow. If it's past 14 minutes, if you can ever buy a control ward and have it not prevent you from completing an item, you should always be buying one. This goes for every role. That means, even if you already have one on the map, if you recalled and have spent your gold on all the items you can, and you still have enough gold left over to buy a control ward, well, you still buy it. You should always be looking to maintain one control ward in your inventory. And then, once it gets past 20 minutes, for junglers, supports, and assassin mids, we recommend starting to purchase two control wards when you recall. This is actually the maximum you can hold in your inventory. Now, you can only ever have one control ward down on the map at a time, but by having two in your inventory, you can use one to clear a brush you're trying to make a pick from if your sweeper is on cooldown, making sure it's not warded, and then still have one left over if you 
you need to use it for a future brush or to make sure objectives are clear of wards before you start them. I really can't overemphasize just how much of a game changer this is. So much of the mid to late game strategy is about rotating around in the jungle, doing objectives like Dragon and Baron, invading the enemy's jungle. Knowing the enemy has no vision in a brush can literally win you games by itself, and so it's always worth that 75 gold investment of picking up a control ward and 150 gold investment past 20 minutes for two control wards, as that small investment can literally turn into game winning team fights and objectives. All right, and our next mistake has to do with players not understanding the three zones in the mid to late game. Mid to late game macro is primarily defined by three zones, the collection, neutral, and pressure zones. When minion waves are in your collection zone, a player on your team will need to move there to farm the wave to make sure you're not missing out on the gold and experience by having the minions die to your tower. Then, ideally, that player will then push all the way through the neutral zone into the pressure zone. So what happens then? Well, that question is actually easier to answer if you flip the zones around and view it from the opponent's perspective. The pressure zone you push the wave into is the enemy's collection zone. By pushing the wave there, it forces the opponent to respond to the wave and farm it unless they want to miss valuable golden experience. Once an enemy arrives at their collection zone, there's three main macro tactics that are then used. The first is pushing into roaming. You can see here, Poppy is in the pressure zone. Now, when she crashes the wave on the tower, it gives her a timing window to pivot off and roam on the enemy. Here's another example. The enemy cannon pushes to our collection zone. We come to pick up the wave as Orn and start pushing it back. In this case, we stop at the neutral zone as to not get caught out over pushing. This can still be fine to do as the wave will still push into the enemy's collection zone. You can see how this now forces the enemy cannon to react to the wave being in that collection zone. And with cannon lured away, we can start a fight guaranteeing we have the number advantage. The second tactic is to push into farming the enemy's jungle. Here, Poppy pushes the wave into the pressure zone, lures the enemy trundle top to pick up the wave, and uses the timing window to steal the enemy's red that's spawning. After this, we're back to pushing into the pressure zone, trundle comes to collect, and now we're off to steal the enemy's raptors. And finally, there's pushing into taking the tower. Here, trundle pushes the wave into the pressure zone, but nobody from the enemy reacts. When this happens, you just simply punish them by taking the tower. Now, here is what everyone gets wrong. So, Graves is leaving the base in the mid game. Now, take a look at the lanes. The enemy top is pushing to his pressure zone. The enemy bot is pushing, currently in neutral, but will be in the pressure zone soon. So, Graves can expect one of his teammates will be going top to defend and pick up the waves, as well as someone going bot to pick up the waves being pushed there. These moments are when teammates have no pressure. It's the enemy team that has the pressure, and so everyone should be looking to just play safe and farm what resources they can. For Graves, that means clearing the topside quadrant, playing in sync with his teammates. Now, his Kled got a kill top, and will be entering the pressure zone shortly. At the same time, his Fizz is pushing bot, and so will be entering the pressure zone as well. Great. Our team is the one who's going to have the pressure advantage, and you can see how you want to adapt to this by not farming the bot side jungle and instead opting into one quadrant clearing into pressuring the map with them. In this case, using that pressure to try and invade and steal camps. Now, let's pause here. This is the moment where everyone always messes up. You see how Kled is pressuring top? Well, he's committing to taking that tower. He's not pushing into roaming. So, the enemy Jax has respawned by now and is not defending. He could be ignoring that top side and coming to fight mid instead. This is the mistake you have to avoid. Once it's clear the enemy is giving that tower up for free, you have to play a bit safer and just make sure you don't get caught out, as the only way the enemy can make up for the tower they would lose topside is through getting something mid right now. You can see how Graves almost got punished for this mistake greeting for a control war. Now, shortly after, we see the next common mistake to avoid. If we look top, Kled took the tower and is now recalling. We then spot Jax, so we know where he is and that he's come to pick up the wave in the collection zone. The problem is, our Kled is no longer pressuring, and so once that Jax clears that wave, he'll be able to get to any fight mid before Kled. Again, Graves tunnel visions, this time getting the mid tower with Harold, not realizing he can no longer do that since he has no pressure topside. And as that tower is destroyed, you can see Fizz, who got the bot tower for free, is now recalling and is going to be off the map as well. So that means the enemy Cassidy can react to this fight first. We've lost our pressure in both side lanes. And sure enough, they get hard punished for overstaying during this time and die and lose their big shutdown. The reason why this is such an easy mistake to make is at one point your teammates are pressuring those side lanes, so you feel like you have a license to go aggressive. But you look away for a couple seconds, tunnel vision on something for a little too long, and suddenly your teammate has recalled or decided to do something else, and so that pressure is gone. If we go back to the moment here, where Kled is recalling topside, and Fizz is taking bot tower for free, this is a perfect time for Graves to transition to playing safe, and either use this as a recall timing, or just go and finish clearing the rest of his bot side jungle. Instead, when you play out of sync with your teammate's pressure, that's when you end up getting caught and throwing in the game. The reverse of this can also be true, meaning, if we go back, after Graves cleared his topside quadrant, if he didn't recognize that his Kled and Fizz would be applying pressure, 
pressure and just opted to farm his bot side jungle that's still playing out of sync. That would leave all of his teammates a man down, making it more likely they would lose any fights that break out on the map without being able to take something else as compensation. And for our final mistake, this is the most common way players throw their leads. They try going for an inhibitor before taking Baron. This is totally understandable, as on the surface it seems like by taking an inhibitor first, you get the super minions pushing, which then means you have that pressure to set you up taking Baron. In reality though, it's incredibly difficult and rare to be able to take the inhibitor in the first place without a Baron buff. This is due to what we covered earlier. The inhibitor towers are both so close to each other and the enemy's fountain that the enemy team is able to easily get to towers in time to mount a defense. I see this nearly every game. Baron is alive, one team has a big lead, they get baited into thinking they can take the inhib tower only for the enemy to show up and collect their shutdowns. And there's typically two causes for this. Players either think taking Baron is scarier than it really is, or they just don't know the tactics needed to set it up in the first place. So let's fix that. So just like we taught you in Mistake 6, pushing mid is a great way to set up Baron. You continually push into rotating to clear vision until the enemy has to face check you or just gives it up for free. However, there's a few other tricks to be aware of. First is when you spot the enemy jungler on the bot side of the map when Baron is alive, like in this case. Since there are no camps or objectives in the area, it means Rengar is likely looking for a pick on the squishy 80 carry Varus bot side. Shortly after, you can see a Jinx rocket on the minimap. This indicates the enemy doesn't have Baron warded and we're scared we were doing it. So look to hover near Baron and as soon as the enemy support shows bot side, now is a great time to call for Baron. This is because we know they don't have it warded and if the support is bot side, when we saw the jungler bot side not too long ago, it's very safe to assume a lot of the enemy team is hovering bot side looking for a pick. And here's the trick. When going for plays like these, you just watch the minimap the whole time seeing how the enemy is reacting. As soon as we see Jax casually walk back to lane bot side, that's a very good indication they have no idea what's going on as Jax would likely either teleport in or rotate if he had no TP. And sure enough, the enemy was waiting in the bot side jungle looking to make a pick on Varus. So we pick up Baron in the process despite being behind 2k gold on the enemy team. This is why you can't show bot side as a jungler when Baron is a threat. It's too easy for the enemy team to take Baron as there's no threat of a smite steal. The other time to force Baron is when you get a kill on the enemy jungler. Here, a random team fight breaks out mid. As soon as the enemy jungler dies, it's time for Baron. This is because the only consistent way the enemy team can steal a Baron is through smite stealing. When you're still alive with smite, you can always force Baron with the number advantage if the enemy jungler is dead. It's pretty much the same concept as when the jungler shows bot. When your team has smite available on the top side when Baron is alive, you should always look to start it. Worst case, you watch the minimap, you can see the enemy is rotating, so you either bait the fight and turn on them, or you just back off and don't lose anything for trying. An even more advanced way of using this tactic is when the enemy jungler dies before your jungler in a fight. For example, here a fight breaks out mid, and Graves ends up dying early. Shortly after, a second fight breaks out, where the enemy jungler Shivana dies much later than Graves. This means Graves is respawning and getting back onto the map much earlier. So Graves knows to immediately start Baron, since it's guaranteed they have that smite advantage, as Shivana won't be able to get there in time to try and steal it. Alright, now if you want to take the next step in your macro journey, there's nothing better than our brand new macro course at skillcap.com. In just 15 easy to understand steps, we will take you from the start of the game to the end of the game teaching you everything you need to know about macro in League of Legends. This course has been getting perfect 5 star ratings by players just like you, and is a part of our massive update adding all brand new courses for season 14. So to celebrate this we're offering an exclusive limited time discount through the link below. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description to get the rank you've always wanted this season. Alright, and that will do it for this one. We here at Skillcapped want to thank you for watching, and we'll catch you in the next one.